Senseis. When it comes down to it, they're as integral a part of anime as our main characters. Sometimes they're around for a long time, sometimes they die off early, sometimes they have white hair and cover their eyes. But regardless of what role these sensei fill, a lot of anime would feel empty without their presence. The guiding hand they provide, or the pseudo-parental role that they take up, give a lot of the anime that we love the depth in the warmth that we want. And Naruto is no exception to that rule, quite possibly being filled with more sensei than any other anime in existence. Now this mostly has to do with Naruto's insane and mostly disjointed cast, as every single three-man squad required a sensei or a joni. On top of this, almost every single Hokage or just Kage in general at some point or another was a sensei to another very important character. And because of this, within the confines of Naruto, there are dozens, if not almost a hundred sensei, characters who have been part important values to the next generation. Characters who have taken their unique skills and passed them down to the genin below them. And without this passing of the torch, not only would the generation that we grew up with in Naruto be significantly weaker, but we also wouldn't have got the rich backstories of Mike Guy and Kakashi and Jiraiya and Kuranai and Asuma, characters we've grown to love. So today, I want to talk about the sensei of Naruto, but not in a usual way. See, I don't want to talk about whose sensei beats another sensei in a battle. That's a video we can make at another point. Who's the strongest teacher in Naruto? But no, today I want to talk about the teaching ability of sensei in Naruto, the legacy that certain sensei left behind through their students. While the conversation about which sensei is the strongest would be invigorating, today I want to tackle the idea of which sensei was the best sensei, who raised the strongest students, who made the children they were given into adults, who took the time to foster a relationship with their students to make sure that they grew up to be the most well-rounded shinobi possible. That's the question I would like to explore today, which is why today we're talking the top 10 sensei in Naruto. But before we get to ranking these teachers like we're a local superintendent, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. My ability to make content is super dependent on you guys, so if you go ahead and follow my other YouTube channel, The Weeb Commander, where I talk about every anime that's not Naruto or Boruto, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'd also greatly appreciate if you went ahead and followed my brand new podcast that I'm doing with Danny Mata called Utaku's Anonymous, where me and him break down everything that happened in anime this week. So, teachers, how do you rate them? Every single teacher has a different teaching style, a different situation, different students. It's hard to look at one teacher and rate them on something you would rate another teacher. How can we look at a teacher who's teaching something like chemistry and a teacher who's teaching something like Spanish in the same light? They're different subjects with different curriculums and massively different levels of interest. Well, ranking sensei really is no different. Today, we're going to be doing a top 10, but every single sensei on this list has a massively different situation from anyone else on this list. They were all given different children with differing backgrounds, with different abilities that they had to adjust to to try and nurture in the best way possible. And that's what I'm going to be ranking them on, their individual ability to adapt to the children given to them and foster them into well-rounded shinobi. I'm going to be less focusing on how strong the shinobi they raised turned out to be, though it will absolutely be taken into consideration, and more focus on the individual effort made by independent sensei to make sure that these children grew up into fine shinobi. So now that we got the rules out of the way, I know I said it was a top 10, but I do have three honorable mentions. However, since they're honorable mentions, I'm kind of going to blow through. The first of the honorable mentions is Minato. What? Minato is not even making the top 10, Nick? How could you put him this low? He was not that good of a teacher. Listen, comparatively to the other sensei on this list, Minato had a very small amount of time with his team. Not to mention that the time that he did have with his team was coinciding with the Third Great Shinobi World War, which meant that for the majority of the time that Team Minato was together, they were not together. As Minato was battling on the front lines of the Third Great Shinobi World War for almost the entirety of the team's formation. Basically, all we see of Team Minato being all together is the bell test, which obviously is a fantastic way to breed cooperation between Obito, Kakashi, and Rin, and they do eventually figure it out. However, when Team Minato competed in their first ever tuning exams, only Kakashi was upgraded to a tuning. And while later on off screen, both Rin and Obito were upgraded to tuning, while Kakashi was upgraded to a Jonin, which allowed them to go on missions like the mission to Kanavi Bridge. Once again, when they were sent out on this mission, Minato was away from them, being on the front lines of the war, which is why Rin was abducted, Obito was crushed, Kakashi had to take his eye, and while obviously Minato does swoop in at the last moment to save all of them, we're not entirely sure that Minato ever taught anything to the entirety of Team Minato. I mean, obviously, outside of Kakashi learning the Rasengan. However, Kakashi then tried to add lightning nature to the Rasengan and collapsed it, creating the Chidori, 
which he then proceeded to use over the Rasengan. So obviously Minato was instrumental in getting him one step closer to the Chidori, and also told Kakashi to not use the Chidori because it leaves him open to counterattack. But Rin dies, Obito starts the fourth great Shinobi World War, and sure, Kakashi grows up to be great, but Minato also told Kakashi after the death of Rin and Obito to join the Ombu, which was the worst thing for Kakashi because he was already depressed and joining the Ambu just allowed Donzo to get his hands on Kakashi and turn him into a living human weapon. A living human weapon who couldn't protect Minato on Naruto's birthday, who then had to get yoinked out of the root by Hiruzen. The only reason I'm actually even including Minato on this list is because if I don't, people will yell at me. But he was not a good sensei. Second up on the honorable mentions list, we have Kuranai. See, Kuranai was a good sensei, sort of. You see, Kur and I got Shino, Kiba, and Hinata. Not exactly your dream team, but also about as different as Shinobi as you could possibly imagine. She got an Abarame who uses insects, a Inuzuka which uses dogs, and a Hyuga who used the Byakugan. How do you teach that? Oh yeah, Hinata, you're gonna wanna practice on seeing in 360 degrees. Also, go ahead and work on that gentle fist. Kiba, go ahead and practice making a three-headed dog with your professional trained ninja puppy? And yeah, Shino, let's try and get more bugs inside your body today. This woman is just talented at genjutsu. Not a singular one of her genin even thinks about using genjutsu. And yet, her and I did a pretty good job. Shino, to this day, still hasn't lost the battle. Kiba is a famous kind of TV personality in Boruto, even though he is useless. And when Hinata was thrown out by the Hyuga family and marked as worthless, Kurenai stepped in as a pseudo-parental figure, taking Hinata under her wing, being one of the first people to believe in Hinata. And while Kurenai couldn't teach Hinata anything about gentle fists, her believing in her definitely helped in Hinata's growth. So for the fact that Kurenai was handed just an awful deck, she did pretty good. My last and final honorable mention is a shared spot, the third slash fourth Raikage. We'll start with the third Raikage because I like him more in also chronological order. The third Raikage is one of the better sensei from outside of Konoha. He was regarded as a wielder of the perfect spear, his lightning spear, and the perfect shield, his lightning cloak. With the power of his hell stab and his impenetrable lightning cloak, he was all but undefeatable. But learning these techniques was not easy. However, because of the strength garnered by this technique, passing it down through your lineage in the Hidden Cloud is very important. On top of this, the third Raikage was the wielder of Black Lightning, another incredibly powerful lightning release move. And therefore, the third Raikage took it upon himself to teach Darui Black Lightning, as he identified that Darui was the only person in the Hidden Cloud with enough control over his lightning release to use Black Lightning, and then took it upon himself to teach the fourth Raikage his son, Hellstab, and the Lightning Cloak. The fourth Raikage then passed this knowledge down once again to Darui, but also to Killer B, training a perfect partner for him to use the double lariat move. And just like that, A and Killer B became one of the most deadly duos in the entire ninja world, with Darui not too far behind, later becoming the fifth Raikage. Without the fourth Raikage stepping up into a leadership role, Killer B probably wouldn't have been nearly as powerful as he is now, as Killer B not only needed to be very mentally strong, but physically strong to control Giyuki. On top of that, Killer B had to learn how to match A's output for the double lariat exactly, otherwise they would hurt each other. And with that, we've concluded our honorable mention. Should we get into our actual list now? Coming in at our number 10 spot was actually somebody who I was gonna put into our honorable mentions, but then just couldn't even conceive the idea of not having him at least in the top 10, because coming in at number 10, we have Asuma. See, Asuma being the leader of Inashika Cho was predestined. As since the beginning of Konoha, Asaratobi has been in charge of the Inashika Cho trio, giving them earrings to show their unity. However, because of this, Asuma had it pretty easy as a sensei. I mean, the formula had already been laid out for him over numerous generations. The way that an Inashika Cho trio should operate had been done before, and Asuma just had to get his current generation of Inashika Cho to that point. Use the IQ of the Nara clan member, use the size of the Akamichi clan member, and and use the mind transfer technique of the Yamanaka clan member. You can get spicy with it occasionally. You can have the Nara clan member use the Akamichi clan member as a wrecking ball. You can have the Yamanaka clan member connect everybody's minds for communication that they don't have to speak out loud. But so far as nurturing power went, Asuma had a blueprint, which is more than you can say for quite literally any other sensei on this list. So when it comes down to taking credit for how strong Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino turned out being, Asuma can't really take as much of it as any other sensei. However, we're 
Where Asuma makes up for it is being incredibly adept in raising these children into adults. See, while Asuma had a blueprint for how to make these children into powerful adults, he didn't have a blueprint for their personalities. I mean, sure, the Akamichi clan member is going to be hungry and the Nara clan member is not going to want to do anything, but there's no blueprint on how to interact with them. Asuma had to tackle deep personality issues with each of the members of his team. He had to make Ino care about more than just her appearance in Sasuke, turning her into a full-fledged shinobi who fought for deeper meanings than just superficial things. He had to make Choji care about things outside of barbecue, like fighting for his friends. I genuinely believe without the influence of Asuma, Choji never would have taken the tri-colored pills in the Sasuke retrieval arc. He made Choji realize that there's more important things on Earth than food. But Asuma's true greatest achievement is Shikamaru. As Asuma was a pseudo-parental figure to Shikamaru, even though he came from a relatively loving family, and they would spend hours together playing board games, and Asuma would always lose. And Asuma would use the opportunity of these board games to talk to Shikamaru and analyze how he analyzed things, which allowed Asuma to not only get closer to Shikamaru, but also allowed Asuma to pull Shikamaru out of the darkness a little bit. So Shikamaru, like a lot of the Nara men, was lazy. But lazy to the point where he didn't want to do anything ever. And while Shikamaru is still sort of like this, Asuma turned him into a man who's willing to give up his laziness to help those around him. And while in the process of curing this laziness also made Shikamaru into the greatest strategist on earth. Er. And while you can't give 100% of that credit to Asuma because obviously Shikamaru's IQ is in the 200s, Asuma gave Shikamaru the motivation to be a better man. However, unfortunately, comparatively to the other sensei on this list, Asuma had a very small amount of time with his team, as Asuma is pretty much one of the first deaths in Shippuden. However, the profound effect that the loss of Asuma has on the Inishikacho trio should show you just how close Asuma was to all of them, specifically Shikamaru. With Shikamaru actually picking up Asuma's smoking habit in the manga, only to give it up when he flicked Asuma's lighter at Hidan's body. Coming up after Asuma, we have Tsunade. And here's the thing, I know what you're gonna say, Tsunade only ever trained one person, and that was Sakura. That's actually not true. Tsunade has directly trained three people, Sakura, Ino, and Shizune. And while obviously Sakura is her greatest student, Shizune and Ino are nothing to scoff at either. See, when Ino was going through a somewhat identity crisis and was trying to figure out how she wanted to become powerful, she began to train under Tsunade and learned a little bit of medical ninjutsu. And while Ino is nowhere near Sakura or Tsunade as far as medical ninjutsu knowledge goes, Ino having a little bit of medical ninjutsu knowledge massively helps the Inashikacho trio, as it was actually Tsunade who recreated the entire ninja system when she demonstrated how effective it was to have one medical ninja on every three-man team. On top of this, Tsunade was able to nurture Shizune into one of the greatest medical ninjas on Earth. See, Shizune has the ability to create cells. It's a yin-yang release that allows Shizune to regenerate generate entire organs. However, she's only able to use his ability with incredibly precise chakra control. And in fact, it was Shizune who molded Hashirama's cells into an arm for Naruto. So Tsunade showing Shizune how to maximize her own potential was massively useful for the plot of Naruto moving forward. But yes, of course, her greatest accomplishment is Sakura. When Sakura was at a loss, when she saw Naruto and Sasuke become these monstrous powerhouses, she went to Tsunade for help. And Tsunade, upon realizing Sakura's precise chakra control ability, decided to train her. And the Sakura trained under Tsunade for three whole years during the time skip. And over this time, not only became incredible in medical ninjutsu, but also learned the Byakuya Seal, a seal that allows Sakura to store a massive amount of chakra that she could tap into to increase her mitotic regeneration at any point, giving her access to what many call is the Hundred Heal Seal. And with the use of Sakura's precise chakra control, Tsunade taught her a lot of things outside of medical ninjutsu and the Byakuya Seal, like her ability to coat her body and precisely located chakra to deflect ninjutsu, or how to use the precise control over her own chakra network to make herself basically immune to genjutsu. And with these powers that she learned from Tsunade, not only did Sakura find the courage in herself to stand side by side with Naruto and Sasuke, but also found the power to battle against the likes of Kaguya with no boosts from Hagoromo or Obito, making her the only person in that battle without Sage of Six Paths chakra. And not only is Sakura universally regarded as one of the strongest ninjas in the world, she's now one of the more likely contenders to become the 8th Hokage and has been running the Konoha Hospital by herself for 
12 to 15 years, she has effectively taken over Tsunade's mantle as the greatest healer on Earth. And without her, Naruto and Sasuke would have died two to three times already. So the fact that Tsunade not only made Sakura one of the most powerful Kunoichi ever, but also taught Sakura how to feel the confidence in herself that she needed to feel as though she deserved to stand toe to toe with Naruto and Sasuke, Tsunade is taking our nine spot. But since we're talking about sensei who are only known for training one person, next up at number eight, we have Mike Guy. Mike Guy was also given kind of a weird team, but at the same time, the team was also kind of perfect for him. For all intents and purposes, Mike Guy was given three Taijutsu experts. Well, obviously 1010 leans closer to Buki Jutsu, I believe is what it's called when you use shurikens. Neji used Gentle Fist, Rock Lee could only use Taijutsu, and 1010 only used summoning seals. They were all either using their hands or ninja tools. And that's exactly what Mike Guy does. However, Mike Guy wasn't an incredible teacher to his whole team. Well, Mike Guy tried to foster enthusiasm amongst his students and tried to make even mundane tasks into training opportunities. Only one of his students would take him up on it, and that would be Rock Lee. But once again, like any sensei who has to train a user of the Byakugan who doesn't have a Byakugan, how do you train Neji? Like, I can't see out of the back of my head. I don't know where the chakra points are. I don't know how to train you in Gentle Fist. How do you train Ten Ten? Hit the seals faster. Throw Throw more kunai, which is probably why my guy focused pretty singularly on Rock Lee, which is also probably why Rock Lee is the only person out of those three who ever became even relevantly powerful. See, like I said, my guy focused very singularly on Rock Lee, teaching him the eight gates technique, which Rock Lee mastered at a very young age. Being able to open to the fifth gate, I believe, in his battle against Gara, and being able to open all the way to the eighth gate by the time that the war came around. Yes, Rock Lee can open to the eighth gate, he just hasn't because he's still alive. The reason I put my guy above the likes of Tsunade and Asuma, who really are one child parents, is because Mike Guy had a lot more to accomplish when training Rock Lee. See, Mike Guy can use ninjutsu. He summons a giant turtle, but Mike Guy was given a child in Rock Lee who definitely cannot use ninjutsu or genjutsu. A massively tall order. And not only did Mike Guy give Rock Lee a personality, but he also dragged him out of a depressive state, giving him a reason to live. Mike Guy was right there next to Rock Lee as Rock Lee tried to train back after his battle against Gara. Well, Mike Guy has absolutely always been trying to get Rock Lee stronger. He's also acted as a father figure for Rock Lee, giving him not only somebody to look up to, but somebody to strive to be. And not only did Mike Guy make Rock Lee into one of the strongest ninjas in Konoha, he also made him into one of the better people in Konoha. Somebody who always put his neck on the line for others, like when he defended Sakura in the tuning exams. Now, some will feel as though seven is low for Kakashi, but I'm gonna push back against that and say, it might be too high for Kakashi. Obviously, Kakashi is the leader of Team 7, but Kakashi did not do the majority of the heavy lifting for the training of Team 7. Every single one of the members of Team 7 eventually went to their own respective legendary Sani, where they would train for three years and learn all of the techniques that they use to this day. Sasuke got substantially stronger under Orochimaru. Naruto got stronger under Jiraiya. Tsunade made Sakura stronger. Kakashi really only had Team 7 for a couple of months. Obviously, they went to the Land of Waves together and Kakashi protected all of them while battling against the likes of Zabuza and Haku. He helped foster teamwork between all of them by using the bell test. He taught Sasuke the Chidori, which Sasuke was able to use against Gara at the end of the tuning exams, putting Sasuke on a level comparable to Gara. And then obviously after the time skip, he's also instrumental in helping Naruto figure out how to create the Rasen Shuriken. But also when it boils down to Naruto training to use his Jinchuriki powers, he passes the buck to Yamato, who becomes the pseudo leader of the second iteration of Team 7 when Sai joins. All in all, he doesn't accomplish that much. He failed to emotionally connect to Sasuke to the point where Sasuke believed he shouldn't leave the village, even though when it comes to generational family-related trauma, Kakashi was about as close as you're gonna get to Sasuke. He never taught Sakura the Genjutsu he should've, and the only thing he ever did for Naruto was teach him how to add wind release to his Rasengan, which Naruto then trained with Yamato to figure out. So like, incredible guy, one of my favorite characters in anime ever, but when it comes down to being a sensei, like, Nothing special. The only real reason I'm adding him to this list is because he did technically allow Sasuke and Naruto to use the Rasen, Shuriken, and Shidori respectively, and those are their favorite moves. Coming in at number six, we have somebody who may not have done a lot, but also did a bunch, because coming in at number six, we have Uruka. See, Uruka might arguably be the weakest ninja in Konoha, as he lost in a battle to a Jonin who lost in a battle to Genin Naruto. But while Uruka wasn't necessarily teaching Naruto anything in terms of ninjutsu or taijutsu or genjutsu, Uruka was the first person to believe in Naruto. 
Naruto. See, Aruka lost his parents the night Naruto was born. Aruka, like any other person who lost their parents on the night of Naruto's birth, had a reason to hate Naruto, so far as the narrative of Naruto would like you to believe. But Aruka put aside that hate and decided to take Naruto on as a pseudo son. Identifying that Naruto was living alone in Hungary, Aruka would take money out of his own pocket to feed Naruto at the ramen shop. And outside of that, just spending time with Naruto, reverting his preconceived notions about Naruto being a monster, giving Naruto a light at the end of the tunnel when it came to all of the hate he garnered, as Naruto was feeling loved for the first time since he lost his parents. Aruka was genuinely the person who sent Naruto on the path to being the future Hokage, putting his own life on the line by deflecting a shuriken meant for Naruto. And outside of that, Aruka, after Naruto graduated from the Ninja Academy, went on many years later to become the headmaster of said academy, molding the brains of young ninjas like Naruto every single day. Not to mention that he held Aruka in such high regards as a parental figure that he asked him to walk him down the aisle, which is something that we haven't seen from any of the previous sensei on this list, so it's big points to Aruka. Coming up at number five, we have a relatively controversial spot because coming up at number five, we have Orochimaru. Listen, when it comes down to being a teacher, Orochimaru was actually a really good one. Let's just do a quick run through of all of the ninjas that Orochimaru has trained. Kimimaru, Sasuke, Karin, Suegetsu, Jugo, the entirety of the Sound Village 4, Anko. Hell, my boy technically even trained Shin Uchiha. And every single one of them came out substantially stronger. He taught Kimimaru how to maximize his Shinkatsumi Yaku using the Curse Mark, which allowed Kimimaru to battle the likes of Gara and Rock Lee simultaneously. He got Sasuke to a level of power where he was about to summon a Karin down onto Team 7 and kill all of them in the beginning of Shippuden. He made Sasuke so powerful that he killed Orochimaru. He taught Suegetsu relative immunity to lightning release. He taught Karin how to maximize her mind's eye of the Kagura. He taught Jugo how to deal with a massive influx of nature energy flowing into him and how to deal with the anger it gave him, teaching Jugo the limits of his ability, while also isolating this ability from Jugo and turning it into a curse mark. Not to mention, he also created Mitsuki, a perfect snake sage, and then taught Mitsuki how to be a snake sage while not being a snake sage himself. He made the sound Village 4 kind of nobody shinobis without the power of the curse mark, some of the strongest ninjas in the early days of Naruto. Ninjas who could now push geniuses like Neji to the brink of their powers. Ninjas who made ninjas like Choji have to take the tricolored pills simply to defeat them. Whether it be by placing a curse mark on you or giving you a bunch of new Sharingan or just teaching you new moves, Orochimaru is an incredible teacher. Now, will he make you a better person? Probably not. Which is why he's five. Coming up at number four, we have Orochimaru's best friend, Jiraiya. Jiraiya has taught a lot of people. Seems to be the role of the Sanin to just kind of have people fall into their laps they have to train. The first people that Jiraiya ever trained was after the Second Great Shinobi World War, when he stumbled upon the Ame Orphans. Feeling guilty about what they had just done, aka destroying the entire country of the Hidden Rain, and most likely being indirectly responsible for the murdering of the Ame Orphans' parents, Jiraiya decided to stay behind and train the Ame Orphans. See, the true goal of Jiraiya training the Ame Orphans was to train them to the point where they could defend themselves. But Jiraiya taught them a lot more than that. Jiraiya also taught them how to live. See, ironically, Jiraiya taught the Ame Orphans a lot of techniques that they would apply to the Akatsuki, like the check-in system that the Ame Orphans would use in their shelter, as if the Ame Orphans were leaving, they would turn a piece of wood that would say they were out. This way, if any of them were abducted, those who returned to the base after would know because their piece of wood wouldn't be turned. And it was moments like these that Jiraiya taught the Ame Orphans how to survive in an incredibly tough world, not only making them stronger, but more prepared for the world at hand. And as all of the Ami orphans were well, orphans, he acted as a pseudo-parental figure for all of them. And he stayed with the Ame orphans until they were capable of defeating one of his shadow clones. At which point he kind of Irish goodbye. And he wouldn't see the Ame orphans again until they killed him. Now, obviously, the Ami Orphan's descent into evil wasn't Jiraiya's fault. It was Donzo's fault. But if he had stuck around or tried to bring them to Konoha, that could have been avoided. But he wanted the Orphans to be independent, and he achieved that. The next person that Jiraiya trained was Minato and the two other people in Minato's squad. Most likely Makoto Uchiha and Teuchi, the guy who runs the ramen shop, but we just don't know. And while obviously Minato turned out to be an incredible ninja, that wasn't super up to Jiraiya. I mean, we learned during the war arc that Jiraiya obviously brought Minato to Mount Muobuko to train to be a Toad Sage, which is obviously a massive power boost for Minato. However, Minato taught Jiraiya about as much as Jiraiya taught Minato, as Minato was the person who taught Jiraiya the Rasengan, because Minato created it. Jiraiya's true influence over Minato was as a human, as Minato looked up to Jiraiya a lot. So much so that Minato was basically Jiraiya's biggest fan when it came to the novels he was writing. In fact, Minato basically used the tale of the utterly gutless Shinobi as his Bible, which is why Minato went 
went on to name his child Naruto after the main character of Jiraiya's book, making Jiraiya Naruto's godfather. Which is why it's kind of shitty that Jiraiya took 13 years to enter Naruto's life, as the role of a godfather is to step in in case the parents die. But Jiraiya's true shining moment as a sensei is with Naruto, as Jiraiya not only taught Naruto the Rasengan, but also Sage Mode, like his father. And thus Jiraiya was once again reliving what he had gone through with Minato, but also imparting his father's jutsu to Naruto. Jiraiya was a passing of hands moment from Aruka to Kakashi to Jiraiya, a man who at a very pivotal part of Naruto's life taught Naruto how to love and how to defend those around you. And while Jiraiya was a pervert and kind of unforgivable in that matter, he was also an incredibly good person who cared about the people around him vividly. And thus in the three years that Naruto and Jiraiya spent together during the time skip, and not only did Jiraiya make Naruto into a much stronger person, but also a much better one. And it's genuinely a shame we didn't get more content from this time period. Well, if Jiraiya's number four, Nick, who are your top three? Well, you're not gonna like it. Because coming in at number three, we have Hiruzen Sarutobi. Ooh, did that make you upset? Some sensei, he left Naruto to rot in an empty apartment. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about all the other good he did with the world. Listen, Hiruzen was a very good sensei. He was literally the sensei to the legendary Sonic, who are three of the greatest senseis in Naruto. And I know you're gonna say, oh yeah, but Orochimaru ended up evil. Not for lack of Hiruzen trying. Orochimaru was an orphan who ended up in Konoha, who Hiruzen adopted. Hiruzen raised Orochimaru from when he was young. And Hiruzen not only imparted the will of fire to the legendary Sonic, but also raised three of the strongest ninjas in Konoha's history. I mean, they were the legendary Sonic, the only people left standing in the second great shinobi world war battling against Hanzo. And mind you, this was before any of their peaks, as they were only 19 to 20 years old when they were battling in the Second Great Shinobi World War. And yet, at this young age, not only did all three of them have monstrous summons, but they were also able to battle toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Hanzo, a force that deflected entire countries out of the Hidden Ray. He was able to train and facilitate the greatest medical ninja of all time, the greatest scientific mind of all time, and one of the greatest sages ever, as all three of the ninjas he trained were not only war heroes in the Second Great Shinobi World War, but the third. As Orochimaru led forces on the front line, Tsunade counteracted thousands of poisons from Granny Chio, and Jiraiya became truly a universal threat to contend with. Not to mention that Hiruzen tried over and over and over again to bring Orochimaru back into the fold. Not to mention after the Third Great Shinobi World War made the elective choice to step down as Okage to elect Minato. Understanding that one of the students he raised since they were five or six years old in Orochimaru wasn't a suitable choice. But this isn't where Hiruzen stops. After Minato's death, Hiruzen actually steps back into the Hokage role and pulls Kakashi out of the Anbu because he's identifying that it's turning him into a monster. And not to mention that the Root sent Yamato to kill Hiruzen and instead of punishing Yamato, Hiruzen took Yamato under his wing, nurturing both Yamato and Kakashi to the point where they were mentally healthy enough to rejoin the regular Konoha. And say what you will about how he ruled as a Hokage, he imparted the will of fire into everybody he ruled over, including Naruto. So while hating on him is absolutely a very popular meme, I'm not not standing for it. He was a very good sensei. But not as good as our number two spot, because coming in at number two, we have Toby Rama Senji. Does Nick find an excuse to put Toby Rama in the higher parts of any list he creates? <laughs> Maybe, but I have a reason for this. Sure, Tobirama was the person who trained Hiruzen. And sure, he was also the person who trained Homura and Koharu, who ended up being two of the worst people in Konoha's history. But he did train Hiruzen. And while based off the criteria that we've done elsewhere on this list, that wouldn't be enough to put him at the two spot. While training Hiruzen is probably one of the most important things that anybody in the history of Konoha has ever done, as Hiruzen pulled Konoha through two great shinobi world wars, defended Konoha against Kurama on the night of Naruto's birth, and so on and so forth, Tobirama quite literally created the Ninja Academy. Without the likes of Tobirama, there wouldn't have been a system in place to raise these children into well-rounded shinobi. And therefore, the curriculum and the system that Tobirama built with the Ninja Academy allowed every sensei on this list to become the senseis they needed to be. So while Tobirama may not have had his hand directly in raising many children into well-rounded shinobi, he is the person that facilitated the entire system to operate. And therefore, it feels silly to not place him near the top of this list. However, if we're gonna look at this from an even grander perspective, we have our number one spot. Because coming up at our number one spot is Hagoromo Otsutsuki. Now, is this a cop-out answer? 
maybe. We know that Hagoromo was directly responsible for the training of Indra and Ashura, his two sons who would go on to be two of the strongest people in humanity's history, with Indra being the progenitor of the Uchiha and Ashura being the progenitor of the Senju. So strong that individually they reincarnated every single generation to continue their battle for 2,000 years. Indra inherited Hagoromo's Dojutsu, which Hagoromo trained him in the Yusa, while Ashura inherited Hagoromo's Chakra, which Hagoromo trained him in the Yusa. And while obviously training Indra and Ashura is incredible, good for you, the true most impressive thing that Hagoromo did when it comes to being a teacher is teaching the entire world ninshu. The Hagoromo, as the Sage of Six Paths, traveled across the entire world, teaching people the spiritual half of Chakra. See, Chakra is composed of two parts, the physical energy and the spiritual energy. If you simply know the spiritual energy side, that is ninshu. This is the spiritual energy of the world that connects all living beings. However, people were able to combine this spiritual energy with their physical energy to create chakra, which they molded into ninjutsu. So indirectly, Hagoromo taught the entire world ninjutsu, but directly taught the entire world ninshu. Not to mention, he was also the first person to learn from the toads of Mount Muobuko. And as every reincarnation of Ashura has turned out to be a sage so far as we've seen, strong possibility that he also taught Ashura how to be a sage. Not to mention that he also created the nine-tailed beasts and taught them all to protect humanity. And while some of them got burned by humanity and started to hate them, they didn't start that way. So yeah, for the super chill act of teaching the entire world how to use chakra and ninjutsu, I'm gonna have to say Hagoromo's probably our number one sensei. What do you guys think? Who do you think is the greatest sensei in Naruto's history? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. People are gonna be like, oh, it should have been Dryad number one. How many sensei on this list were killed by the people they taught? Only him. Oh wait, no, Orochimaru. Never mind.